So this problem uh, had like a shoebox type thing, and it was 10, I don't know, feet by three feet by four feet, and it said find the volume. And then there were a whole bunch of problems related to this box. And then uh, this was in the green packet, by the way, this problem. Then it said, how many cubes that are one inch by one inch by one inch would fit inside this box? And this was a problem that a lot of people were stumped by a couple of classes ago. Um, and so I just wanted to talk about it as, a, as an entire class right now. So um, uh, did anybody remember the volume of this box? It was the first part of this question. It was 120 what? So the volume was 120 cubic feet. So that was the very first answer to the problem, was find the volume of the box. And, um, and we're going to use that to answer this following question here. But let's think about what one cubic foot is, a single cubic foot. It's a 3D object. What are the dimensions for something whose volume is a single cubic foot? Right, so we've got length, and we've got width, and we have height. And what are they for a one cubic foot box? One, one, and one. One foot by one foot by one foot. Yes, that's what one cubic foot is. It's the amount of space that will fill a one foot by one foot by one foot box. All right. So uh, the previous part of this question said how many one cubic foot boxes, one foot by one foot by one foot, fit inside? Well, it's 120. That's what a cubic foot is. But this problem talks about uh, a one inch by one inch by one inch box. It's a little teeny tiny box, one inch on each side. And so the main idea here is that, all right, so we're trying to figure out how many of these little tiny cubes will fit inside of this big space. So let's imagine a uh, one foot by one foot by one foot box, okay? Just a cube, one foot on each side, all right? So the question is, how many of these little one inch by one inch by one inch things will fit inside of our box? Well, let's see. Um, how many inches are there? So let's say this is roughly one foot. How many inches in foot? How many inches in a foot? 12, 12 inches. So there are 12 inches uh, in the foot. So let's see. So one foot is 12 inches. And so I'm imagining taking my little one cubic inch box and trying to squeeze it into a cubic foot. Well, let's see. There's one foot is 12 inches that direction, but then my cubic foot box is one foot in this direction too, so how many inches in this direction? It is also 12 inches. So if I imagine maybe just making a square, forget about the, the cube part, forget the 3D part, but just a square. So how many of my little inch things will fit inside of here? Let's see, so if I just had the one row, I know that I can fit 12 of these things up here. That's not exactly 12, but we get the idea. And then I can have another row of 12 of them, yes? So how many of these little one inch by one inch things fit in here is 144, is 12 by 12. But then there's this other whole third dimension that I'm going to have a hard time drawing on our two dimensional smart board here. But just imagine taking this thing and pulling it out of the board to make a 3D box. And I have another foot coming out of the board. And how many inches are in that foot that's coming out of the board is another 12 inches. And so how many of these little cubic inch guys can I fit in here? Well, 12 times 12 times the 12 that just came out of the board. So uh, to answer this problem, I think all we need to do is take the 120 cubic feet and multiply it by uh, 12 inches, which is in one foot, and then multiply by 12 inches in the next foot and then multiply by 12 inches in the last foot. Up to the third. So 120 times 12 times 12 times 12. That's how many of these little cubic inch things fit inside. Questions on this one? OK, so that's some big number that, that is in the answer key. All right, so uh, again, we're on page 70. That's where we start today. And uh, now, let's see, so a couple of notes. First, you will need a calculator for the lesson after this one, not today. You don't need a calculator today, but just a heads up, Wednesday, you're going to bring a calculator, all right? Wednesday, bring a calculator. Um, OK, exam one, we have not talked about, but it's coming up soon. So let's take a quick look at the calendar. 
So uh, we can see here, exam one is happening on September the 30th. Today is September 23rd. When is September 30? Monday. One week from today is our first exam. One week from today is our first exam. So uh, what is happening in these next couple of days? Well, uh, today we're going to cover something called section 1.7. And the next class, 1.8, notice it says bring the calculator. Then Friday is our review day. Nothing new on Friday. We're just going to spend the time taking, doing a practice exam. You know, it's not graded. It's not timed. It's, it's just going to be you guys working with your neighbors, and I'll walk around and help out. And then Monday is the exam. Again, there's going to be a calculator part on that exam. So what is the exam on? Well, everything above that line that says exam one. Said another way, if you happen to have the uh, homework, where is it? Not there. Do not have the homework assignment out? Oh, this one. Um, if you happen to have uh, the homework assignment sheet, the green one, um, then uh, everything on this page is what's on the test. So this is the second page, and the first box was the first quiz material, and both boxes represent the first test. So exam one is the material ends right there. Okay? So uh, back here in the blue, it talks about resources. We're not going to read them, but you've got lots of practice materials in the blue packet. You have lots of practice materials in that yellow QEF thing. Right? There was practice quiz, practice exam, and even more practice problems besides those two. And there's plenty of stuff on Moodle for you to look at as well. OK? Any questions about what's coming up? That exam is a full period exam. It's longer than the quiz was. Uh, to be honest, it's actually written to be a 30-minute exam, um, but everybody gets time and a half. We're just going to build that into the class period. Time and a half would make it 45 minutes. Everybody will get 50, right? But some of you will finish in less than half the class, and that's okay. But I just want to point out it's longer than the quiz. It is meant to be longer than the quiz. Okay, can we start with Kyle for the objective? Thank you. Dwight, number one. Thank you. And I'm sorry to make you read that whole thing, Dwight, but part of what I was after, but having somebody read that out, was for just to all of us to absorb how complicated that equation is. It is far more complicated than any of the equations we saw last class. Now, technically, uh, by the end of the semester, I think we'll be able to solve this one doing just straight algebra. Uh, you'll have to do something called distribute. It's 3.9. We'll need to multiply. You don't need to write this because we're not doing it now. But I just want to point out how hard this is at this moment, and there will be an easy way, and that's part of the point of today. But you would need to distribute that 3.9 through. Then you would need to do something called co combining like terms. We'll talk about that in due time. Then you need to get all the terms with B on one side and all the terms without B on the other side. And then finally, you'll have an equation that will look like the ones that you solved last class. Okay? So there's a lot of work to make it look like the ones that we can handle as of last class. Um, and all of the arithmetic is complicated by the fact that there are messy decimals floating throughout this problem. All right? So we don't want to solve this the, quote, algebra way. We want something different. OK, so let's take a look at the graph. It says use the graph. So here's a graph. We've seen plenty of graphs this semester. Almost all of them have been straight lines. So I just want to point out that uh, this highlighted thing right here appears somewhere else on this page. Where does it appear? It appears right here. So the, apparently, the thing that is graphed is p equals all of that highlighted yellow stuff. I guess what that means is that another name for this thing, according to the graph, is P. Yes? That's, this, that's what P is. I mean, it's like Y, but we're calling it P in this problem. So what that means is that this problem is really asking us to figure out when is P equal to 60. That's what we're trying to do. Find when P is equal to 60. Now, is P on the horizontal axis or the vertical axis? It's on the vertical. I mean, you can see it labeled there. And it's like the Y. So what we do is we go find a place where p is equal to 60. 
So I will do that here. This is where p is equal to 60. Yes? And then you have to go either left or right to try to find the graph. In this case, we're going straight to the right. So go ahead and go straight to the right. And until you hit the graph, you can put an arrow there if it helps. So we found p equals 60. We went straight to the right until we hit the graph, that diagonal line. OK, so I've got this point. I'll highlight it here in green. There's a point that's on the graph, and apparently it's important in this problem. But we have one final step to finish this problem. Um, can you go back up to the original equation? What variable are we trying to find is b, right? And p doesn't even appear in the equation. p is just kind of invented in this graph. But b is what we're after. OK, well, where's b on the graph? Is it vertical or horizontal? It's the horizontal axis. So you have that green point. You just need to find the input variable. It's like the x. So where do we go from that green point to find the b? We go straight down. So it goes straight down, and down here we find the b. There's still a tiny bit of work because you have to figure out what that number is, but whatever that number is, that's our estimate for this problem. One vote for 36. It's not trivial. I mean, there's work to do to find that number. You know, I mean, I, I, 36 sounds reasonable, but it could be 37 or, or 34, but we've got to do work to find it, right? So how do we figure out what those lines represent in this problem? Yeah, and I like that, that Sadie said count the, the, look for the distance between. So we're not counting lines, we're counting spaces or squares. So um, I don't know if all my lines are, uh, is there a line that's, that's right there? That's one line, right? Okay, so there's one, and then two, and then three, and then four, and then five. Everybody see the five spaces? And five goes into that 20, how many times? Four. So each of those blue line segments is four long. And then you can, uh, you can figure out, let's see, that's four, and that's four, and that's four, and that's four, and that's four. So 36, however you get there. OK, so then our answer to this problem, let's see, uh, the answer is 36. Well, one little detail that I'm going to ask for. Yeah, I want an equation. And it even says give an equation here. It's not just this random floating 36. It is b equals 36. B. E. B. E. Yeah, you'll know um, which one it is because if you look at the original equation again, there's no p in that equation. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's the b down there. Okay. Now, b equals 36. It might not be perfect. The right answer might actually be like 36.1 or 35.8. I don't know. We can't, I mean, anytime you look at a graph, you're going to be estimating. But that's what we're after here. And this answer is a very good estimate to a hard, hard problem, but it's an easy way to answer a hard problem. Questions on that? Okay, on the next page, the classwork begins. When it says draw something on the graph to indicate your answer, I'm looking for, you know, kind of something like the purple lines that I've drawn up here. Just something where you show me the process you went through to find the answer. Okay, raise the flag if I can help.